identity is everything. Not just identity in a sense of uh, categories or boxes or squares that you're checking off, but really being able to place, you know, who you are and then how you're interpreting that um, in your life and then in the wider world. Trying to find your identity is one of the hardest issues and people get so caught up in that. I believe that people, when they know more about their story, have more empathy for other people. They, and having more empathy ultimately means we're more kind to one another. Every ancestor that we have has a story waiting to be told. And all we have to do is find that ancestor. And that story will be unleashed. <laughs> It was only in retrospect that I, I realized when my love of searching for ancestors was born. And I even know the date. It was July 3rd, 1960. And that was the day that we buried my father's father, Edward St. Lawrence Gates. Then we came back to the Gates family home. And my father took us upstairs to his parents' bedroom. And he's looking for something, furiously looking for something. My brother and I don't know what's going on. And finally, he finds it. And you know what it was? It was an obituary. It was dated January 6, 1888. And it said, died this day in Cumberland, Maryland. Jane Gates, an estimable colored woman. An estimable colored woman. And he said, that is Jane Gates. That is your great-great-grandmother. She's the oldest Gates we've ever found. I never want you to forget her name. And I never want you um, to forget her image. So I figured, wow, I come from this woman who possessed enough quality and dignity for this adjective to be mentioned in her very short obituary. I wanted to connect myself to the man we had buried and to the woman whose photograph we had found in my grandfather's scrapbook. I knew it had to do with ancestry. I had been doing some research on my family, so my hope was I'd learn a little bit more about my family. I was intrigued because I was already on some level in the mind frame of doing that type of research. We knew that there were some blanks in our family tree, and I was thinking, you know, maybe we might find some connections or whatever. We were all separated as a group at the beginning. Um, and then they brought us together uh, to meet Lisa and have her start to give us the background. Nice to meet you. Sky, okay. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Gail. 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 Scott, nice, nice to meet you. Gail. And then we were just like, hi, how you doing? Didn't know really why we were all together. Well, welcome to Brooklyn. Uh, we want to talk a little bit today about the history of this area. Uh, Brooklyn at the time, about eight, early 1800s, is really a highly agricultural area. So once the ferry came into existence, the life in Brooklyn started to really boom. There was a Navy yard that was built down the way. More and more ships were coming in. More and more factories and industries were being built down here. Because there was such hustle and bustle, it also made it a, a great place for fugitive slaves during that time to come into Brooklyn instead of the city. Because going to the city was more dangerous. Slave catchers trying to return them to their masters for rewards or things like that. And as slave catcher, I mean, is this a job that anyone could take on? Do you have to be deputized? Or what was, how did that work? No, I mean, anyone at any time was encouraged to return a slave to the owner because it was, a slave was considered property. If you harbored a slave in your home or if you helped them across a, you know, a river, you were considered a thief because you were stealing property. The Fugitive Slave Act was telling people it is a law that you, if you know something, you have to then disclose that information. One common misconception is that New York, being a free state since 1827, uh, was a safe place for African Americans, and it really wasn't. New York was heavily, heavily invested in the Southern economy. Whereas Brooklyn, on the other hand, they were very pro-union. There was a lot of abolitionists. Think about that right across the way. It's its own Mason-Dixon line, so to speak, right? Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do now is do a walking tour through some different places around Brooklyn that have some really cool historical value. Mm -hmm. 
So this particular place is home to a very important person in Brooklyn. His name is Lewis Tappan. Lewis Tappan is an extremely important abolitionist. He was one of the founding members of the American Abolitionist Society. He was a very successful merchant and leveraged his wealth for uh, abolitionist causes. Even in abolitionist circles, he was considered extreme. Mm. Uh, he believed in interracial marriage. Okay. And this is in the 1850s, where that's just yeah. Yeah. not something that happens. Yeah. In fact, it was illegal. He also helped with many people that went through the Underground Railroad. Underground meant secret, and railroad was just uh, an emerging uh, technology for transportation. The stations were places that people stopped. The conductors were the guides that helped people on their way. People themselves who were escaping slavery were often referred to as passengers. A lot of the people that were in the Underground Railroad went to Canada because slavery was abolished there, and so that was the true safe haven. It's a very complicated uh, construct of people that were both white and black helping people get to freedom. He actually brought a fugitive slave to his home and gave this girl a Thanksgiving dinner up in the attic while wow. he was entertaining guests down, down below. below. Wow. So had to hide her. This particular fugitive slave actually dressed up as a boy. The more you dig in, the more it becomes real people with real challenges and aspirations, and you start to feel that much more connected to your own history. So we finished here. We're going to take you on one last stop. Dear Gail, welcome to Plymouth Church. You are sitting among more family members than you may realize. This place played a critical story in lives of many people, including your own family. It was in the hidden corners and secret passages below this room that many enslaved people found their way to freedom. Your family was among them. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Plymouth. <laughs> Plymouth is a really fascinating place. Henry Ward Beecher and the people there at that time were able to influence the way that people thought about slavery in the run-up to the Civil War. I don't know if any of you have heard of Henry Ward Beecher, but in his own day, he was a superstar. Henry Ward Beecher was outrageous. I mean, he was a passionate, abolitionist with a flair for the theatrical. He was a dramatic, fiery preacher who drew attention to important social issues, most importantly, ending slavery. This space was built in 1849 under the direction of Henry Ward Beecher. As we come forward, we'll just take a little moment to notice the row that has Abraham Lincoln's signature on it. This is where Abraham Lincoln sat when he visited the church in February of 1860. But if you imagine this church in the time of Henry Ward Beecher, it would have been filled to the rafters with people. There was no Brooklyn Bridge at that time, so people would come across the river by boat, which came to be nicknamed Beecher Boats because so many people came specifically to visit Plymouth and to hear Henry Ward Beecher speak. 2,000 people would come from all over the place. The drawings from the time, it's just a sea of faces because everyone was so absolutely fascinated by Beecher and what he was saying. He was a, a total rock star. Dear Niall, welcome to Plymouth Church. You are not the first person from your family to find their way here. You are sitting above a catacomb that changed the story of so many people who, like your ancestors, took matters into their own hands to earn their freedom. Uh, we are now in the upstairs section of Plymouth Church. In a little while, we're gonna go visit the basement. There was a second level of activity happening here where members of the congregation were working along with members of the Underground Railroad to help people escaping slavery find their way north. Mm -hmm. Dear Gail, welcome to Plymouth Church. You are the daughter of Carol the daughter of John. Daughter of Robert, the son of Joan, who was the daughter of John. Daughter of Ronald, the son of Joan, who was the daughter of John, 
who was the son of Joseph, who was the son of Mary, who was the daughter of John and Arabella Weens. John was a free man, but his wife, Arabella, was enslaved. Their children were also enslaved and eventually separated. Hope for reunion became real when the Weems' first daughter, Mary Jane, escaped to Canada. She was free for the first time since her birth. In a powerful demonstration that she finally had control over her own life, she took control of her own name, changing it from Mary Jane to Stella. It may seem small, but imagine the feeling it would have given her to be able to determine for herself who she was. John found in Stella's escape that there was hope for all his children to be together and free. So he came to New York to raise money to buy his own family back. Realizing that the slave trader was making it impossible to buy Anna Marie's freedom, a plan was made, she was able to escape. And she made her way to Brooklyn, dressed as a boy, oh wow, where she was helped by the family of someone in this room. Wow. Mm. Wow, I'm sorry. It's like everything is coming back to me. Dear Seth, as you already know, you are the descendant of one of the most influential members of the Underground Railroad in New York. You are the son of Diana, the daughter of Daphne, who was the daughter of Rosmond, who was the daughter of Ellen, who was the daughter of William, the son of Lewis Tappan. Lewis believed in equality and felt deeply that there must be an end to racism. He was a member of this church and may have stood in the spot where you are now. His home is a short walk from here and his doors were open to provide haven for fugitive slaves. If you look around, you are among the family members of Anna Maria Weems, who has a very personal connection to your family. Lewis Tappan sheltered her in his home after a harrowing escape. She spent her first Thanksgiving night in safety. Regardless of the risk, Anna Marie stayed hidden in the Tappan's home till it was safe to smuggle her to freedom in Canada. Enclosed, you will find the records of a family reunited in Canada in 1861. I went to Canada two years ago for the first time in my life, and I, I felt like at, at home. It, you know, it was really a powerful experience. And it's so interesting because in my family, I've been the one that's traveled a lot, just maybe searching for some pieces, you know. And I also remember some years ago having an experience. It was like a meditation, but it was more than that. But it was, I could, it was a woman you know, and it was like an ancestor. She was like a slave, and she, she, she wanted me to say her name. She was like, "Say my name." If there was no name. You know, I didn't, I didn't know the name. Um, but there's some names here, so thank you. We are now in the space that came to be known as the Grand Central Depot of the Underground Railroad. Mm. Being down there itself wasn't very welcoming. Because I'm too tall to be down there and imagining what it was like for them, especially if it was a majority black men who were down there. You're the son of Jade, the daughter of James, who was the son of Lydia, who was the daughter of Mary Weems, her parents, John and Arabella, fell in love near Washington, D.C., married and had children. Mary Weems Savoy, your great-great-grandmother, mm. died in 1936 at the age of 80. She left behind a growing family, and their children's children's children are here today. <laughs> so I guess we found <laughs> You're <family. laughs> Oh, my god. Wow. Are you kidding me? 
I'm this, the whole day, this is my cousin? It's amazing. He reminds me of my brother. He has that same resemblance. And when we first walked up at the water, it was like, okay, wait. The experience of coming into this place would have been just one or two people. They would be brought here by a guide. They would land at the Fulton Landing and then walk up the big hill to Brooklyn Heights. And they'd spend a night or two nights here and then leave again at night and continue on their way. And when people are here, I always like to give them a little bit of the authentic experience because it was really more like this. It would have been total darkness. It would have been someone alone. You are son of Christopher, son of Muriel, who is the daughter of Frank, who is the son of Mary, the daughter of Sophia Gray, who escaped slavery with both of her children through the assistance of the Underground Railroad. What's so incredibly powerful to me about Sophia Gray is that she went through the Underground Railroad with her two children. Uh, one was 12 and one was 15. And it was very rare for a woman with children to come through the Underground Railroad because it was very, very dangerous. And so for her to leave with these two children and to hide in the hull of a ship, and the ship was boarded. They told the people that boarded them that there might be yellow fever aboard. So luckily they were saved and they then went to Philadelphia and then from Philadelphia they took a carriage to New York and came through the New York uh, Underground Railroad and then they made their way to Massachusetts. The only thing I knew was that we were Scottish and I thought our, our tie was gonna be that my family came through Scotland, through Canada. Muriel is okay. your grandmother that you don't know a lot about. Right. And her father was Frank. Albie and Andrews. And Frank was a silent film movie star. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yes. In fact, he was in films with Mary Pickford. Wow. Oh. What's fascinating to me is watching the, the race identification throughout time in the records, where they were listed as mulatto, which means mixed race. Uh, black sometimes, but then from about 1910 on, white. What you're saying is, is that Sophia and, and Mary were African American. Yes. And just, they were lighter skinned, and so it just, they, at that time, they switched it from African American to white. Yeah, later on, it wasn't until Frank, and I think until he was an actor, and I would speculate that perhaps he needed to make sure he got work. Right. And to be a black actor when film started, he was very, you were pigeonholed specifically into certain roles, but to be a white actor would give him more opportunity. So and he you, was white enough to pass, as it do were. Do you know where the Andrews name then? I mean, like, because Mary Etta Gray must have married somebody She married named an Andrews, Andrews who is also African American. Really? So this is like totally different than my family ever. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I knew it, right? <laughs> I said that though. Did you it's say amazing. I said to watch <laughs> I'm proud. The hope and the faith that this woman had who came here by herself and then sat in that basement in the dark, it's unreal. I mean, who would not be inspired by that? These are strong ass women. These women like, you know, threw it on their backs and they did it. You know, they survived. Uh, this has been, um, <laughs> it's been a moving few hours and certainly last hour or so. Um, I have to say, I, I read this and I listen to these stories and you just feel like you're not doing enough. Mm. You just feel like you're not doing enough. It's like, I don't think that any of us, I don't know, could really like say, what you really were gonna expect. It's just like, um, so you're like, okay, we'll just take this journey. My cousin keeps saying it's an adventure that we're just gonna take and we're just gonna do it. And, you know, um, it's, it's amazing because as you sit here and read the letter, 
and you're sitting in this place, it's just so much emotion and everything that comes over you. It's unreal. We all have made each other's history happen, and ultimately it's learning from our mistakes and trying to make the next decision better than the last, and trying to make sure that we leave our story better than we found it. My grandfather uh, taught us that you only get one name, and what are you gonna do with your name? What comes behind it? I come from a really, really strong, tight-knit family. To see the information that Ancestry gave us further proves that's how um, our family lineage is, because from the weems on down, everybody just stood together. Um, from finding out from John and Arabella that they, he fought to get his family back together. And to see now that we come from this legacy of family and fortitude and sticking in there and just not letting anything waver is just like totally mind blowing because it all makes sense now. It's like it's all come together, it's all full circle, it all makes sense. That word estimable, that adjective that I encountered when I was nine, how did that make me feel? That I inherited, I hope, some of her estimation, and that maybe I could go on and become an estimable person too. That we are the sum total of our ancestors. You're not limited by their limitations, but you have the potential of their accumulated sets of possibilities. And that you are a product of their stories, even though you don't know it. Let me 